um, in the solutions we get, because remember CFD is just an, an approximation of, uh, of the solution to those Navier-Stokes equations. And if necessary, we can go back round and I can refine the mesh, add more elements to the mesh, because I don't think we're capturing certain aerodynamic phenomenon um, accurately enough. So that's what the process looks like. Eventually, um, eventually, I'm going to move on to this one first. Eventually, we end up with these uh, plots here. So we end up with things that are of fundamental importance, like the lift and drag against the Mach number of the car. So as the Mach number varies, I want to know how the lift on the car is changing. Actually, I'm hoping that lift will be negative and be a downforce, um, and how much the drag is varying. So I can answer two important questions. Um, the first, and probably the most important question, is will the car stay on the ground? Okay? That has always been the primary question in my head whenever we make a geometrical change to the car. What has that done to the lift variation against Mach number? Is the car going to stay on the ground? The second thing I ask myself is, what's the drag variation against Mach number? Are the engines that we've got installed in this car still generating enough thrust to get us to 1,000 miles per hour and back down to zero again in the space we've got available? But we also generate lots of pretty pictures like this. Okay? Um, this is a plot of the pressure distribution on the left over the underside of the car, varying with Mach number, and on the right-hand side across the desert surface that the car is running across. So in this plot, the purples are the very, are the very deep purples, are the high pressures, and then you go through purples, blues, greens, uh, yellows, oranges, red, and red is very low pressure. So if I run this again, as we approach Mach 1, you'll start to see the formation of these things we talked about a moment ago, these shock waves. That's when things stop changing very smoothly, and you get these very, very sudden transitions, like here, and like here, and like here. And making sure we're, we're, we're predicting the positions of those shock waves accurately, and how they move along the vehicle as the speed changes, is of critical importance um, in terms of dictating um, the aerodynamic performance of the vehicle. Just uh, quickly, because I think this is fascinating, one other area of research um, that's been going on for many decades now and is continuing, and, it's, and in the whole world of CFD actually um, depends um, in an integral way on being able to do this, mesh generation. I'm just going to show you um, what a technique called Delaunay mesh generation looks like in two dimensions. Okay? So in the middle of this uh, circle, there's an aerofoil shape. Essentially what we want to be able to do is fill the space around that aerofoil shape and with inside the domain that we're interested in, with lots and lots of little unstructured triangles. Now that problem is actually incredibly complex. Okay? What we're actually doing here is ultimately we're finding the inverse, um, we're, doing the, we're finding the inverse of, of the Voronoi problem. So if you, if you can go in and do this actually on a scrap of paper, okay? put a cluster of randomly scattered points on a piece of paper and try and fill in spaces around each of those points such that if you're inside that space, your closest point is the point in which you, you, the, the space around it is surrounding. That didn't make a lot of sense, did it? Okay, cluster of points, okay, and you've got to split that space up so that whenever you're inside the volume that's surrounding that point, you are closest to the point that's inside that space. Does that make sense? So that's the Voronoi problem, and what you end up with in the Delaunay triangulation is the inverse of that space. Mathematically, it's a really interesting thing to look at. Um, and there are still lots of people doing lots of research trying to find out the most efficient way of doing that. Now that's in two dimensions, but we live in a three-dimensional world. So imagine extrapolating this problem into three dimensions and you start to get a feel for um, how interesting this problem is. Okay, how am I doing for time? We're... How long have I got, James? Sure, a few more minutes. Okay, right, I'm going to pass that. It was going to be really exciting, but we're going to have to get onto the more interesting stuff. Um, so what we've done is use this method, CFD, so mesh generation, solvers, um, post-processing analysis um, of the results that come out of the solver to guide the design of the car. So this is the initial concept for the car that landed on my desk back in 2007. It took us a year to get from this design here to this one here. This was the first car geometry that I received where we ran it from Mach 0.3 all the way up to Mach 1.4 and it looked like it was going to stay on the ground and the drag was going to be low enough for a Eurofighter Typhoon engine and a rocket to get us to 1,000 and back. That was the first time I said, went back to the team and I said, I think we can actually do this. It then took us three years to turn that into something that's actually engineerable. Okay? Something that um, the mechanical engineers were happy with, the structural engineers were happy with. And this is the geometry that we're now building. Okay? We've started building the chassis and we've got a company on board who's doing the whole front, the, the whole front half of the car is going to be um, carbon fiber monocoque. And that's all being built right now. Um, so that's the journey we've been on. Um, each of those design iterations there has taken probably about three months or so of CFD analysis to get us to that final design that I showed you. So this is uh, a 
picture of the pressure contours over this final, um, what we're calling config 10, the final design. Um, and this is it again here. I'm going to skip through this because that's the mathematical version of what I'm about to show you, which is a little bit more interesting. This is, so we're at the point now where we, we think we can probably get the car built by the end of this year, fingers crossed. If all the sponsorship money keeps flowing in, by Christmas time we'll be rolling out the car from our workshop in Bristol. Um, and hopefully summer next year we're going to start testing this out in the hack scheme pan. So uh, this is what we think it could look like next summer. Bloodhound SOC, you're cleared. Engine start. Bloodhound engine start. Ready to roll. <laughs> 